favorite. If you have your Bibles, turn to that passage, Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to begin in verse 1, read down to verse 4, then we're going to jump down to verse 14 and read down to verse 17. I share with you over and over again that God has created us with these three very important needs within us. And fulfilling those needs are, are what move us forward and help us grow and mature psychologically, emotionally, and, and spiritually. And when those needs are not being met, then it hurts us, it, it thwarts our growth, and we end up being something different than God's intention for us. There is that need to belong. There's that need to believe, to have this truth that we commit to ourselves, that we build our life upon. And then there's that need to become, that, that growth and, and progress, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and in all facets of who we are. Well, this morning we're kind of looking at that first need, that need to belong. And it's not just the idea that we are created to be in a relationship with others or to be a part of a, a group or a part of a family. That's certainly a part of it, but that need goes down to the very core of our psychology and our physiology where there is this need for intimacy. There's this need to be touched. There's a lot of studies that have been done over the years. There was one done years ago by a psychologist named Harry Harlow. Harlow studied the psychology of touch. And he conducted an experiment where he took young monkeys, as soon as they were able to be, he separated them from their parents. And these monkeys were raised in isolation, and they noticed that the monkeys were constantly crying out and making noises, trying to have interaction. He formed and fashioned these two wire frames that resembled the shape of a, of a parent. And with one, he attached a bottle so that the monkeys would receive nourishment. The other, he covered in this, this cloth that was thick and, and it would simulate the, the cloth and the fur of a parent. And he found that those monkeys would, would crave or, or would cling to that, that frame that had the cloth on it. That, that when they were not there, they would sit in the corner and they would hold themselves and they would touch themselves to, to experience that sensation. When they were hungry, they would cross over and they would drink from the bottle. But then as soon as they were done, they would come back to that other that simulated a mother's touch. Now, the sad thing is you can go from the the psychological experiment that was done and you can see psychological trauma that was perpetrated upon people when the wall came down and, and communism in Russia and, and in the Eastern Bloc fell apart they went into Romania and they found that when a child was an orphan, they would take it to an orphanage and they would put it in a room, they put it in a bed and they would come and feed it, they would change his diaper when it needed to but they left the child alone the child didn't experience that touch. These children would scream. They would cry for hours wanting somebody to come in and to touch them. We need to be touched. And this morning we're going to look at what Jesus does to satisfy that need. The book of Matthew is, is an interesting gospel. It, like all four gospels, has a perspective. It, it, it has a, a purpose. And Matthew's purpose, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was to present Jesus as the King. Jesus as the Messiah. And so Matthew sets out, writes his gospel in that way to help present Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of what the Jews were looking for and longing for. This section we're in right now actually began back in chapter 5. And it's got two broad subsections, chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. It, it talks about the authority of Jesus' message. And now we are looking at Jesus, His authority 
as it's revealed through his miracles. Chapters 8 and 9 are loaded with some miracles. This little section that we're beginning today, we're going to, we'll finish it up tomorrow, it's just our next Sunday, it's just three miracles in a row. And what's interesting about these three physical miracles where Jesus brings healing to someone's life is that he conducts these miracles or performs these miracles for people that the Jews in the first century would have seen as outcasts. These are people that have been marginalized. I love the way one preacher has, has kind of labeled these three stories. Uh, this isn't original with me, but, but it really does kind of, I think, capture it. He says, we're looking at the story of the untouchable leper, the unacceptable Gentile, and the unprofitable woman. And we know that's of God because, after all, it is alliterated, and it's easy for us to remember. Well, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at that first story, the untouchable leper, and we're going to look for a few moments at the end at the unprofitable woman, and we're going to see these two healings that Jesus performed, that Jesus conducted. And I want you to remember as we're going through these and as we look at the one, uh, the story of the centurion next week, I want you to remember that it's these outcasts that experience the grace and the power and the love of God in their healings. Well, let's begin in verse 1 and, and read down to verse 4, then skip to verse 14. It says, When he came down from the mountains, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him, knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gifts that Moses commanded it for a proof to them. Now in verse 14 it says, And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law laying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness, and he bore our diseases. There are few symbols in Scripture that have the power to communicate like leprosy. When you see leprosy in the Old Testament, you see leprosy in the New Testament, it is always, always, always a picture of the power of sin. It's invasive nature, the pervasive nature of how it spreads, and the destructive nature. Now, in recent times, just within, like, since the 1980s, Scientists have actually discovered a battery of, of, um, of antibodies and medicines and things like that that you take 12 to, to 18 months that will push back leprosy and it will spare life. We have gone from millions of cases down to thousands of cases in the world in the last 30 plus years. But if you go back to the first century, if you put yourself there in Jerusalem when they received this, this gospel written by Matthew and you begin to read this story, if you're a first century Jew listening to this being read to them or standing and reading it for yourself, when you saw that, you realized that this was hopeless. That leprosy was a death sentence. And what we find in Scripture that there's only one cure, there was only one hope, and it was the miraculous power of God to bring a miracle and to bring healing to their bodies. So what I want us to do this morning is to just think about what Scripture says within the context of this culture at this time about leprosy, and by extension see the problem that we all face with sin in our lives. Just, just two points this morning that I, I want to bring to you, that I want to show from Scripture. First thing I want you to understand, we have all experienced the tragedy of sin. Every single one of us has experienced the tragedy of sin. The Word of God is crystal clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our parents made the decision 
in the Garden of Eden to commit sin, to violate God's Word, to violate God's will, they sinned. And when they did, they were transformed. They were changed by that sin. That, that image that they were created in, the image of God that was perfect, that image was still there, but it was tainted, it was twisted, and that sin nature took up residence within them, and they have passed that down to us generation after generation after generation. There's not a man, woman, boy, or girl with the exception of Jesus Christ who has ever been born that was not born with a sin nature. And when we look at what Scripture says about leprosy here, I believe that we can get a good picture of what sin is and what it does, what the tragedy of sin is in our life. First off, first off understand, sin is injury. Sin damages every person in every place that it takes up residence. Leprosy is this horrible, slow, pervasive problem. What happens is, from my understanding, is that in your extremities, in your arms, in your hands, in your fingers, your legs, or your toes and such, you'll get this pain. And the pain will not go away. And before long, you'll begin to look, and maybe it's on your hand or on your arm, and you'll see this little white spot will begin to develop. You'll think it's a blemish. You'll think it's, it's, it's um, some chemical has fallen on you. And then you begin to notice that around that white spot, all the hairs in that area begin to turn white as well. Before long, that, that little spot, that little white area begins to grow. And then eventually lesions begin to appear on your body. You begin to experience sensory loss. And what I mean by that is that you no longer have the sensation of feeling in areas of your body. You really begin to enter into a, a very dangerous stage because what happens as your fingers, as your hands, as your feet begin to lose that sense of feeling, you may just walk by something and scrape something. You may fall down and, and hurt yourself. You may, may cut your hand while you're, you're cooking something one night and you don't even know about it. And before long, if you're not careful, that area will become infected and it becomes much more difficult to heal it or to, to deal with it. Lesions begin to appear. You have the sensory loss. The, the extremities begin to, to pay the price for it. Gangrene begins to set in and your body parts begin to deform. They begin to literally die upon your body. And if it's left unchecked, eventually your bones and your organs begin to deteriorate. Leprosy is a slow death sentence. Friend, let me tell you something. Sin is the exact same thing. Sin follows a very similar path. There is a point in your heart, there's a point in your mind where you are attracted to something. Your heart, your mind is drawn away towards that which is sin. And it's always the same thing. There's this temptation to satisfy this God-given need in a God-forsaken way. I've been talking about this, this need to belong, this, this need for intimacy. And, and there is that need, that desire to have that person that completes you there, that companion that, that completes you and, 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 and kind of makes you whole in a, in a worldly, spiritual, emotional sense. And, and you want intimacy within that relationship. But temptation comes in and it draws your attention away and it draws your attention to someone else. And you begin to seek intimacy in that relationship. It starts with just this little thing thought, this little idea in your mind. Nobody wakes up in the morning, sun shining in the skies, bluebirds singing, everything is wonderful, money in the checkbook, gas in the car, all the bills are paid. Think, I'm going to wake up today, I'm going to go out of the house, and I'm going to find someone commit adultery, and I'm going to destroy my marriage and my relationship with my children. Nobody wakes up and, and says, you know, that guy down the street, um, his grass is nicer than my grass, and I'm tired of everybody talking about it. I think I'm just going to go down there and kill that man, put him out of my misery. It doesn't happen like that. But it starts that little moment of darkness in our spirit, in our heart. And if we leave it unchecked, it festers and it grows and it brings death. Leprosy is injury. Leprosy is isolation. Listen to this passage from Leviticus 13. 
Leviticus says, as Moses is giving them the law and instructing and guiding the, the community and, and how they are to interact together and how they remain pure before God, uh, Leviticus 13, 44 says, Then the priest shall examine it, and indeed, if he is a leprous man, he is unclean. The priest shall surely pronounce him unclean. His sore is on his head. Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean. All the days he has the, store, the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. The dwelling shall be outside the camp. Sin is isolation. Sin separates us from others. When you were a leper, immediately your family had to remove you from their proximity. Matter of fact, most families, when you were pronounced to have leprosy, you, were, you, would, leave their, you would leave the family, you leave the house, and you leave the community, and you'd go off. Most families would go ahead and have a funeral. Because in their heart and their mind at that time, you were now dead to them. They can no longer see you. They can no longer interact with you. They can no longer grab you and touch you. You were now ostracized. You were separated away from them. Isolation in that you had to have your face covered and you wore special clothes and such. And as you came along the road, you cried out, unclean, unclean. So that as people would be traveling, they would see you and they would take a different route or you would step off the road and they would pass by. You wouldn't have that interaction. There was no sitting down at the coffee shop and, and having a good time with a friend for an hour of a cup of coffee talking about how the day went. These, these lepers in the area, they would congregate together and they would find a place and they would create their own little colony. They would be separate unto themselves in the misery and the pain of their, of their bodies decaying and they would be isolated away from everyone else. That's what sin does. We give in to sin. We make the decision that we're going to give in to the temptation. And then that temptation, that sin shows itself and we live with shame. We live with guilt. We live with remorse. And it begins to separate us from other people. People see what we've done. They hear what we've done. They know what we've done. They know the pain that we may have brought to a relationship. They know the disappointment and the way that we have conducted ourselves. And they begin to distance themselves away from us. Susan Greystack, we found this show on, on Netflix that came out a couple of weeks ago called Sweet Magnolias. And I'm going to tell you straight up, it is a Hallmark, lifetime movie kind of a world. It's not good acting, it's not good writing, but it's actually a pretty good little show. And for the most part, it's clean. And if you're like Bill and you've watched a lot of these Lifetime movies, you know there's kind of this, this way they go about it. There's a young woman, very attractive. Um, her husband has, has divorced her or her husband has died or she was married to the mob or something like that. And so now she's in this little town that looks like Norman Rockwell painted it, this little picture of America. And um, she feels isolated. She feels alone by herself. And then there's always this handyman, baseball coach, um, whatever teacher teacher is it's just good looking look like he should be on the cover of harlequin romance like leonard was back in the day and so that's what happens in this in this tv show the the husband was a doctor and he cheated on his wife with one of his young clerks or nurses or something like that and the young lady that plays the part looks like she's 22 years old and and now she's pregnant the man, the doctor, and his wife are going through a divorce, and their son's baseball coach just happens to be good-looking. And so the wife is kind of attracted, and they're dating them. Well, what's interesting in all of this, and they're the primary ones, the, the young lady that is pregnant with her boyfriend's baby, eventually they plan to be married. They live in this small town somewhere. Every time she walks into the store, everybody gets quiet. Every time she goes, she went to a party the other day that, that nobody could believe that she showed up and everybody gets quiet. They begin to whisper. They begin to kind of point and talk about her. And she walks around with that shadow, that specter over her probably the rest of her life. I'm not justifying what the character did. It was, it was wrong. But that's what sin does. We're attracted, we're drawn away, and we never think about what's going to happen tomorrow. How is it going to, how is it going to play when people find out about this? Third thing that our leprosy teaches about sin, sin is incurable. 
I'm not going to read it again, but that passage I just read out of Leviticus chapter 13, if you notice something, it tells how to, how to isolate, how to separate, but it doesn't say anything about how to cure it. That's the problem with law. That's the problem with, with religion is it can create boundaries and it can create barriers and it can tell us when we cross the barrier. It can tell us that we are sinners. It can tell us why we are sinners. But it has nothing to tell us on how we can stop being sinners. It has nothing to tell us how we can have our sins forgiven. That's what Jesus has to do. Jesus is the only cure that we have for sin. It's not reformation of our behavior. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's not remorse. It's in repentance and forgiveness from Christ. Years ago, there was a documentary about the wildlife in, in India. This, this camera crew was going to go into the, the brush and, and they were going to film and, 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 and be carried through the brush and see these different animals and their habitat and such. And they had this, this old man who was an Indian native, lived there in the area over in India, and um, he was going to guide and direct them. And so two or three days into the journey, they get to this brush area and he stops them and he says, let me explain to you. We're going to a brush area that, that is filled or loaded with, with king cobra snakes. And they're one of the most dangerous snakes that we deal with. And he said what they will try to do is they will try to sneak up and they will jump up and try to bite you in your abdomen, try to bite you in the stomach area. One of the gentlemen that was on the trip asks him, he says, well, if we're going through and that snake jumps up and we don't see it to the last second, it bites us in the stomach, what are we supposed to do? What's the remedy? What's the cure? And the guide says, find yourself a very nice tree, go and sit down, and die. He says, we have no hope. We have no help for you. Friend, understand, apart from Jesus Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sin. We are spiritually dead because we are born with a sin nature. We are destined for eternal death, separated from God forever in a sinner's hell. And we are living spiritually dead, separated from God in this life. That's the tragedy of sin, is that we're living this slow death, waiting for the cemetery. But praise God. Not only do we experience the tragedy of sin, but we can experience the touch of the Savior. Let's go back and look at the passage again. I love the picture we have of this leper in verse 1 and again in verse 2. In verse 1 we find this confidence. He came down from the mountain. I'm talking about Jesus and the crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and he knelt before him. He comes up in confidence. We don't know what happened. We don't know the time frame. I don't believe that he was diagnosed with leprosy on a Monday and then he heard Jesus was in the area on a Tuesday. The, 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 imp the impression that I get as you read this passage and as you read this story, the impression that I get is that this is a man who's lived with leprosy for quite a while. That the leprosy had begun to spread. And that he probably was at that place where he was sick and tired of being sick separated from family. He was sick and tired of his body hurting. He was sick and tired of, of all of, the, all of the, the, the things that come from having leprosy in his life. And someone told him, he heard about it, and the Holy Spirit of God inspired him. And he got up and he went down and he had the confidence that this is the one who can heal me. And when he comes to Jesus, he's not standing there demanding it. He's not standing there negotiating it. He's humbling himself before the Lord, and he's crying out to the Lord in humility. What a beautiful picture we have of what prayer is. Prayer is, is reverence for the person and the power of God. Prayer is confidence that because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the fact that we have been accepted into His family, adopted as children, that we will be heard by God Almighty. Prayer is humility as we humble ourselves before Him and we ask of Him and the Lord provides as the Lord sees fit. Drop with me down to verse 14 and, and, and verse 15. You'll see the connection here. It says, And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever, and he touched her hand. Jesus touched her hand, and the fever left her. She rose. She began to serve him. 
Now understand that word that is used there in, in verse 15 is the same word that's used in verse 3. It's a word that Matthew uses about nine different times in his gospel. There's a couple times where it shows up in the same story. The woman who had the issue of blood and she had in her heart, if I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, as soon as I touch him I'll be healed. And Jesus knows that someone has touched him. But about half of the times that it's used, it's a picture, it's a word that used to describe an activity on Jesus' behalf. And it's not just the idea of a, of a casual touch. It's not just the idea of this, of this casual little caress. It, it, it means that he reached out and he grabbed hold of them. The woman was laying there. He reached out and he picked up her hand and probably put his other hand on top of it. It's that, it's that moment of connection. And understand, when we look at the rest of the Gospels and we see the way that Jesus heals people, he didn't have to touch her. Matter of fact, he didn't even have to be in the same room with her. All he had to do is speak the word, and the leper would have been healed. The woman would have been healed. But what an impact the touch of Jesus has upon a life. I tell you what, all my life it seems like growing up in church, we've sang that wonderful, song, that wonderful hymn, He Touched Me. I can still, in my heart and my spirit, hear George Beverly Shea singing that in the old Billy Graham crusades. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me. Now I am no longer the same. He touched me. He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now I know he touched me, and He made me whole. Why did Jesus, why did He touch them? He didn't have to. He chose to. Why did the Holy Spirit of God inspire and lead Matthew to write this element of the story in both of these stories? That touch is a touch of understanding. It's a very simple action that Jesus was using, I think, to proclaim that He understands. I guess most of us in this room, we remember 1992. We remember the election. You know, Reagan was president for eight years, and after Reagan, H.W. Bush was president uh, for four years. Communism had crumbled. Our world went into a recession as we were transitioning from a Cold War economy into a new world economy and such. And at one point, George Bush's favorables were the highest of any U.S. president has ever had. And so there were a lot of guys that wanted to be president that think they didn't think they had any chance of beating Bush in 92, so they put their name in the hat. And then as though somebody in cosmic control has this great sense of humor, one of the most improbable candidates won the nomination. Bill Clinton had gone to a foreign country and protested the United States and been a part of a flag burning. Bill Clinton got on national television and joked about his underwear. And there was rumor that was decades old of all the women that he had run with and he had chased after and all these kinds of things. And all of us young conservatives looked and thought, there's no way in the world that that young man from Arkansas, which Ross Perot said was inconsequential, it's like running a Walmart, Arkansas, there's no way in the world he was going to beat somebody like Bush. And I believe with all of my heart that Bill Clinton was able to win the nomination and become the president because of four words. When people were hurting in the recession, he would get out there, take his jacket off, and he'd get out there amongst the people, and he would take you by the arm, and you're sharing your story. He'd look at you and he'd say, I feel your pain. And people believed him. He'd been in government his entire adult life. He'd been on a government paycheck, living in the government housing, being driven around on government vehicles. But for some reason, people believed him when he looked at them and said, I feel your pain. Friend, understand something. There are people dying in sin all around us every day. And they have this idea that the church and that believers and that Christians, they don't care one bit about me. 
They want to know that you understand. We have a Savior that understands. We have a Savior that has been there and understands pain. It was a touch of compassion. That Jesus understood what it meant to be isolated. He understood what it meant to be, to be disappointed by family and friends. He understood what it meant to be mocked by his brothers. He understood what it meant to be hungry and to be thirsty. He understood what it meant to be weary. And because he's lived and he's been here with us, he has compassion for who we are and for what we're going through. That touch was identification. I am God of glory. I created all things with a word and I have condescended. I have humbled myself. I have taken on the form of a man so that I can identify with you. That means when we stand before him one day in glory, we're not going to be able to say, Lord, you don't understand. When this temptation came against me, you don't understand. Jesus is going to say, I walked the same streets. I dealt with the same problems. I was there just like you are. It's a touch of identification. Galatians chapter 4 says that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He identifies with us and he died in our place. I believe that the key to all of this is in that very last verse that we mentioned just a moment ago, verse 17. After we look at the story of the leper, we'll look next week at the centurion. As we look at the story of, of, of Peter's mother-in-law, in verse 17, Matthew kind of summarizes this. He says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and he bore our sins. Understand what that means. It doesn't mean that Jesus just walked into the world and said, well, I understand life is tough on you. We're going to set your sins over here to the side. Jesus came into this world, lived a perfect sinless life. The Father hung him up on a cross and all the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus became sin for us. That in his death and resurrection, he would break the power of sin over us. Jesus became illness for us. So that in his death and resurrection, he would break the power of illness over us. He touched them to let them know, I am with you. And I love you. And you are mine. There was a missionary, I believe he was a Catholic missionary, named Joseph Damien. In the 18th century, he went to the Hawaiian Islands to minister to lepers. God had a, a, a work on his heart, had a calling on his heart, and he was humble and he was submissive to wherever the Lord wanted him to go. And so he went to a group of people that, quite frankly, was not going to build a, 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 grow a, build, a growing church. Okay? First Baptist leper town is not going to be expanding. In that way. He went to a place that was not going to be on television or, or on the radio. He went to a place where people were in need and he loved them and he began to serve them. And as he served them, his heart broke for them and he gave of his life to them. One afternoon he was preparing himself a lunch and, and he had boiled, he'd boiled some water for some tea and doing some other things. And when he poured the water in, the water went in too fast and hot boiling water splashed out on his hand. And he saw it happen, and he didn't feel it. And he knew what had happened. That next Sunday morning, he stood before his small congregation, and he said, Welcome to worship, my fellow lepers. He now could understand and identify with them a way that he never could have before. So I want to draw a line right down this morning, in the middle of this morning. I want you to think on one side, you may be sitting here with sin in your life. And you think well, nobody will understand. 
Nobody will forgive me. If anybody found out, I'd be living with shame the rest of my life. Friend, understand something. The Lord already knows, and the Lord understands. The Lord identifies. That's why He came into this world. But let me tell you what more reality is for our group, our group this morning, because I, I believe that probably every one of us really here is, is really genuinely saved. There are people all around us who are spiritual lepers. Sin has grabbed hold of their heart, has grabbed hold of their mind, and they have done things that they shouldn't have done. They have sinned against God. They have broken hearts, disappointed people. They've done all of that, just like we have done. And right now, they're hurting and they're struggling because they want someone that will love them, that will care for them, that will forgive them and accept them. That's what we're here for. We're here to love the lost. And we're here to help them come to know Jesus Christ's forgiveness. To be welcomed as children into the family of God through the power of the gospel. So I'm asking if you would bow your head and close your eyes and no one looking around. And maybe this morning you just need to experience for the first time in your life, the forgiveness that God offers through His Son, Jesus Christ. Or maybe